Yeah, I'd just like to uh, thank the Telegraph for <coughs> inviting me to panel uh, to, to uh, chair this panel session and, uh, and thank the, our three extremely experienced panelists for joining us. I think this is going to be a fascinating day. And I think it's really interesting that we're kicking <coughs> off with transport because transport is an absolutely key agenda item when it comes to almost everything we're going to be talking about and discussing today. Um, and I think it's interesting that in some ways, I mean, we have representatives of what you might call two transport hubs here, but of course I think both would argue quite rightly that there's so much more than that. And then of course we have the interaction between um, large transport hubs, although as we'll hear they're more than that, and existing local communities and local infrastructure. What I find fascinating is that increasingly now the concept of simply a transport hub or an airport or an interchange, uh, a railway interchange, is actually an increasingly out of date concept. And we'll see that we're, what we're actually talking about here is placemaking and is driving um, economic development, environmental sustainability, and quality of life issues by genuinely integrating transport issues at the heart of the wider economic development agenda. And the concept, uh, putting that into the context of the smart city development and smart infrastructure agenda is something we're going to be kicking around a bit with our three panelists now. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to make a, a fairly short introduction to who they are and a little bit about their thinking, just a couple of minutes each ideally, and then we're going to kick into a bit of a conversation. And then I've got permission to overrun on the current agenda because we started late. And we're going to try and have a 10 or 15 minute sort of Q&A interactive session with the audience at the end. So if we could start, I think, with Matthew, just kicking off with a, a brief introduction and a few thoughts from yourself on this topic. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. And uh, good morning, everyone. It is a, a great pleasure to be here today, actually. And I think uh, partly to share some of what we're doing in this space, but also to learn from others. I've had some great conversations already. I think it's a very... Uh, very good audience to be engaging with from that perspective. Um, as Dan said, really just a brief introduction. So I'm at Sustainability and Environment Director at Heathrow, and some of what I'll be talking about is how we're using smart city technologies in a broad sense to tackle environmental issues, uh, but also a bit more broadly how Heathrow sees its role. Three key messages I wanted to uh, just leave with you to kick off the session today. Firstly, that Heathrow is fundamental to the success both of London, but also the regions, nations of the UK. Secondly, that Heathrow is a small city in its own right uh, and is already using uh, some of the smart city technologies that exist, both for passengers and the environment, uh, and looking at how we can use more in future. And thirdly, uh, how uh, we believe that expansion at Heathrow will further enhance the role uh, of, and the competitiveness of both London and the, uh, the UK, but critically, I think, allow us to fully integrate with London as a smart city. So just saying a little bit about each of those in turn. So firstly, Heathrow, uh, fundamental to the success of uh, London and, and the regions and nations of the UK. So um, Heathrow provides 80% uh, of, uh, of the UK's long-haul connectivity, so of our long-haul flights, uh, and it's therefore a, a fundamental economic contributor to the UK. It's the airport that is the UK and London's direct connection to the world. It's not just about passengers, though. Uh, we are the UK's largest port by value, so a quarter in total of the UK's exports. I'll just leave that with you because it's such a significant figure. A quarter of the UK's exports pass through Heathrow, typically uh, in the belly hole under the feet of uh, passengers in the planes at the airport. And clearly, an entity of that size, a kind of economic powerhouse like Heathrow, is a big employer as well. So we employ 76,000 uh, people on airport within the airport boundary at Heathrow, uh, making us the largest single site uh, employment site in the UK. Uh, and we think with a working, I talked about as being a, a small city, with a working population the size of uh, Bradford, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the scale. And because we're a small city, uh, we have a very uh, good, but with plans to improve uh, as well, public transport infrastructure. So three train stations, three tube stations, uh, the UK's busiest uh, bus and coach station. Looking forward, and I'm really pleased to be on the panel both with uh, Victoria and with Heather from this perspective. Uh, we've got real plans to improve that connectivity, really looking to every point of the compass, east through Crossrail into London, north through the link at Old Oak Common to HS2, network rails building a uh, Western rail access out to Reading and beyond, uh, and then uh, south through uh, Southern rail access. So Heathrow, fundamental to the success of London, uh, uh, and the UK's regions and nations. Secondly, um, we're already using uh, smart city technologies, both for passengers and the environment. So just to give you a couple of examples of that, um, 
you'll know if you travel by plane that your journey involves uh, a number of different players, the airline, the ground handler who might put your bags on the plane, the air traffic control in the UK and, London, uh, and Europe uh, who plan your route through the skies, the airport obviously as well. Uh, across Europe, uh, airports are increasingly using a technology called collaborative decision making, which is about sharing the information from those different bits of the journey uh, to make it much more reliable, uh, punctual uh, and seamless. Bringing that actually to individual passengers, we're already beginning to play with different technologies like uh, the Heathrow app. So if you've got the Heathrow app, it will give you more information when you land on which carousel your bags will be on, uh, when the next train into London leaves. So just providing much more tailored uh, information for people once you arrive at the airport on with travel zones which give you real-time information on public transport options from the airport but I think going forward real opportunities to personalize that to give people more of the data and information that they need uh, to make their journeys uh, seamless and we're also using some of those technologies um, to tackle environmental issues as well. Dan talked about ec the economy, quality of life and the environment. So just again, a couple of quick examples to get us going. At the um, biomass plant that we have at Heathrow, one of the largest initiative, uh, initiatives of its kind in the UK, which sources uh, all of the wood chip that powers 20% of uh, Terminal 2 renewably from within uh, 75 miles of the airport. So a real positive environmentally, but positive in terms of a local supply chain. And the pods that some of you might have seen at the airports. These are driverless pods which at the moment connect Terminal 5 to one of its car parks on demand, uh, zero emission at the airport, uh, transport to get around the airport. I think real opportunities in that space moving forward. So Heathrow, fundamentals to success. We're using some of these technologies already. And thirdly then, uh, expansion will further support uh, the role that Heathrow plays uh, for London and the UK's uh, competitiveness, but also uh, London as a smart city. So with expansion, we can add 40 long-haul uh, routes to, the U uh, to Heathrow, connecting uh, London and the UK to global growth, particularly as the focus of the world economy shifts east. And the figures attached to this are significant. The airport's commission set up by the government found uh, that that expansion will add uh, over £200 billion of economic benefits to the UK, 180,000 jobs across the UK, with 40,000 in the area around Heathrow. Uh, and with some of the public transport I talked about, 70% of the UK's population uh, within three hours of this fantastic connectivity that Heathrow, Heathrow will provide. But I think there's also a really exciting opportunity from an environmental perspective as well. I mean, you know, you'll be familiar with the, the kind of public uh, coverage of Heathrow and its environmental impacts. And we do have some significant issues to tackle. But I like to turn that around and look at some of the opportunity. The bar is set high at Heathrow because of some of the impacts we have. But that gives us a real opportunity to think about trialling new technology. Just to float a couple of examples with you. Uh, we're looking at district heating and power for the future. So if we're designing the airport of the future, uh, why not look around at how we can help power uh, renewably and heat some of the areas around the airport, linking up in an integrated way. Um, Geofencing technology, some of you may have heard about, where uh, as cars have GPSs today uh, and increasingly we're moving to either hybrid or electric cars, certainly for hybrids, uh, why not look in air pollution uh, hotspots around Heathrow, a couple of kilometres away along the M4, uh, we've got uh, some air quality challenges, why not look at geofencing where actually cars switch automatically uh, to electric mode uh, in particular areas. So I think some real opportunities go for us uh, going forward. So we're fundamental today, we're using some of these technologies uh, and we think we can do much more in future as we grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma much Matthew. Um, Heather, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing at Old Oak and Park Royal? And, uh, <coughs> Um, yeah, good morning. My name is Heather Cheesborough. <laughs> I'm Director of Strategic Planning, Regeneration and Economic Development at London Borough of Hounslow. And there's two key areas that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, one is where we interface with Heathrow. Um, Heathrow is an incredibly important uh, partner with us and we're working very closely with Heathrow. Um, we have a very strong campaign which is better not bigger. However, fundamental, we do recognise that um, Heathrow is so important to our economy. Over 10,000 jobs are directly attributable to Heathrow. Um, that's just over 10% of the jobs. We have a further 16% of jobs that are um, uh, attributable under catalytic impacts. If looking at West London and, and wider areas beyond, we're talking about another 250 odd thousand jobs. So it would be an utter disaster if Heathrow was to go. But what was interesting about the work we've been doing with Heathrow was to understand that actually here we have a massive economic driver and there is no way that we are, in terms of West London, planning on a sub-regional level. We all sort of have slightly different relationships with the airport um, and we do not plan strategically or 
or sub-regionally. And this became very apparent when we started thinking about, actually, if you've got a huge economic driver like Heathrow, why aren't we planning in a much more sustainable way and thinking about housing and growth and employment and regeneration on a sub-regional level? And from this, we've been thinking about doing a new Heathrow Garden City where we would look to create a whole new settlement in the west of the borough, and that would be... Um, totally geared through the, um, the better infrastructure provision that we would like to see on the back of Heathrow, such as the southern rail access. And this is um, rail access from Waterloo into Heathrow. And we have undertaken a feasibility study to look at how we could have a new alignment that would see a station at Feltham and interchange uh, a, new, a new station at Bedfont Lakes and a new interchange at Feltham, which would help to open up and regenerate areas which are very, very deprived at the moment. And on the back of that, we could have a new garden city of at least 10,000 new homes. And if we started to plan sub-regionally and bring in our neighbouring boroughs, we could see much greater, greater growth from that. And that's just good sub-regional planning. And we see that smart technologies have a huge role to play in that because when you start to grow a new settlement, there's obviously the starting off process when you don't have the right amount of people and the right sort of infrastructure in the right place, no matter how good your town planning is. And that's where smart technologies can really play a role in terms of being very adaptive and very flexible with new communities. And we could do a lot of data monitoring and um, understanding how places grow and plan and tweak in a very responsive way so we get the right transport in the right places. We understand whether places are successful or not in a very quick and interactive way. Way. And then we could adapt our master plans accordingly to address those issues, potentially with crime, um, what spaces are used very well, where are the highest values, um, all those sorts of things. So we're working with Heathrow on that and with our neighbouring boroughs, we're taking a lead on that. And the other area I'd like to talk about is um, the Golden Mile, which is um, an area within, it's, it's a road corridor, the A4 corridor within Hounslow. Um, which is a very employ important employment location. We have um, over 450 businesses there. We have B Sky B, we have GSK. We have the second highest concentration of ICT and digital media in the borough, and a lot of those businesses are focused around the Golden Mile. But it does suffer from huge congestion, very poor public transport. And with the um, development at Old Oak Common, we really want to make sure that we're connected in there through um, a relatively small amount of um, infrastructure, a new rail link that would use existing rail beds, link into Old Oak Common. And you start to really change fundamentally from P-tail levels. And on the back of that also, we see um, that we could have a new rail link into um, Southall up at B Sky B, and again using existing rail beds. And again, that would hugely change p -tail levels. And so an area that already attracts vast amounts of young, highly skilled, digital um, savvy people we could provide the right sort of transportation and accessibility for them. We know that a lot of the uh, workforce in Sky actually call it Skyberia because it's such a frightful place to work. Um, but we think that um, having much better transportation links would help fundamentally change that, and we would see that employment corridor really reaching the potential that it could do and it used to do in its glory days back in the 1920s. So I think I'll, I'll shut up now and let Victoria have a chat. Thank you very much. Uh, so Victoria, um, Old Oak and Park Royal, um, you've got the interesting situation that you're starting with much more of a blank sheet in many ways, aren't you? Do you want to just yeah. talk a little bit about it? Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to introduce um, Old Oak and Park Royal um, to the audience here today. Many of you may have heard of Park Royal, but many of you may not actually know where Old Oak is. And yet, in just 11 years' time, um, we'll have a station the size of Waterloo stopping where trains currently don't stop. Um, it's the only place in the country where HS2 and Crossrail will meet. And therefore, you have two nationally important infrastructure projects meeting um, along with um, three underground, three overground, West Coast Main Line and a Great West Main Line. So you put those 10 rail lines together, and what you have is the most almighty catalyst for regeneration. So Old Oak Park Royal will be the largest opportunity area in London. It's much unknown. Um, but I'm hoping through doing more of these speaking events, I'm getting it uh, much more known. And um, when I talk about sort of large, um, in just putting it into context, 24, 25 and a half thousand homes, 20, um, uh, 65,000 new jobs. That's on top of the uh, 40,000 plus jobs that are already at Park Royal. Um, means that you actually are going to deliver more housing, more, more jobs. Um, then has been seen at VNEB, Nine Elms, and, um, and the Olympic Park, for example. So, um, just linking that back to smart cities, uh, we all know that London needs more homes. Um, Old Oak is a, a fantastic opportunity to provide some of those. 
And what we would like to do at Old Oak is provide and set a new benchmark in placemaking. Place we want to develop a, an exemplar community. And as um, Dan says, that we are actually starting from scratch. There's only about three and a half, four thousand 4,000 people who live there um, currently because most of the land is brownfield. Um, and that provides an opportunity for us to deliver a high-quality neighbourhood exemplar in every form, including SMART. And we see um, using SMART not just for SMART's sake, but actually SMART for city's sake. Um, there is this phenomenal opportunity to build in SMART and future-proof right from the start because, effectively, it's, it's a blank canvas. Um, and we come along at a time where other cities are trying to sort of retrofit SMART um, we've got this golden opportunity um, to do it right from the start. And these opportunities don't come along very often. They certainly don't come along in Zone 2 West London very often, and they certainly don't come along in this size of scale, 140 hectares for our core site. <clears throat> so I'll touch upon some of the aspects, perhaps, as the conversation uh, evolves on particular things that we're keen to do and we're already doing. Um, but how are we going to do it? Well, we're, we've, we've just signed um, uh, an MOU with Hypercat City. Some of you may be familiar with them. Um, it's a consortium of the very best leading companies across the globe who are going to help us um, do two things. One is prepare a smart vision, smart strategy for Old Oak and Park Royal. And the other is to help us build a 3D model um, so that we can start embedding smart right from the start. Um, it's fair to say utilities are driving it from the outset. Um, but um, it will be much, much more than that. So, um, of course, we're not starting from a blank canvas in terms of um, the existing knowledge that exists. We'll be working with the London Data Store. My colleague, Andrew Collins, will be speaking either today or tomorrow on that. Um, he, he's already leading the Smart London Plan. Um, and we're learning from elsewhere many of the cities that you will be uh, hearing from over the course of the next two days. Um, we're really going to capitalise on let's call them the, the millennials, um, the sharing economy, the opportunity to move forward and do things in a smarter way. Um, people's lives are evolving. There's an excellent window of opportunity here um, to build that into the place from the start. Um, so I hope, as uh, the mayor has the opportunity to make a few points this afternoon, he makes the point that Old Oak and Park Royal does provide um, the opportunity to um, to to develop the actual genuine smart city from the outset. Um, so thank you for the opportunity for joining this uh, discussion and um, looking forward to it. Thanks very much. I, th I want to try and, because there's only three of us, let's, well, three of you, right, let's try to keep this relatively informal rather than me interviewing you guys. So feel free to jump in and interrupt each other a little bit. But I just want to sort of plant a thought in perhaps for the um, sort of um, uh, direction, which is one of the kind of guiding principles around smart thinking is about putting the citizen and the passenger and the user experience at the heart. So rather than simply an entirely uh, capacity-led model, this is what you've got. You know, there's one train every hour, like it or lump it. Actually, we're leading more, more and more towards a demand-led approach, uh, putting the citizen and the passenger at the heart of, of, of our development and our thinking. Do any of you have any thoughts about how that impacts on your particular um, part of this equation when it comes to transport and smart infrastructure and development in particular? Well, I think um, in the creation of the new Heathrow Garden City, as I was saying earlier, when you're creating a brand new place, um, you want to, you know, if we do get Southern Rail access in with the alignment that we're seeking with, with a, um, a connection at Feltham and a new station at Bedfont, that's great, but a new rail link is not going to provide the sort of P-tail levels and the public transport accessibility that actually you need to run a whole community off. Um, you need to provide other types of transport. And we need to ask citizens, bearing in mind as I was saying earlier, that this place is not going to be created overnight. You're going to have to start off with a few hundred homes and then a few thousand. And that doesn't really drive the levels of public transport accessibility that you really need. So we need to have people who, um, if we have smart te network technology, we can allow people to make choices about transport um, based on their journeys, the time of day. I mean, key with Heathrow, I mean, it's a 24-hour city, and that there are public transport um, uh, that, that does run through the night. But at the same time, it, it's not necessarily in the right place at the right time. And for individuals, we want them to feel safe and that they can have um, 
public transport as accessibility when they need it. So the use of smart technology is going to be key in that. And it's not just about using buses, which will be key to all of that. But at, for instance, Heathrow have got the little pods. I don't know how many people have used them, which go from the car parks. But they're fantastic. And we've been looking at them both in respect of, of our new Heathrow Garden City, but also the Golden Mile, because they provide a much more flexible um, provision of service. And again, it, using technology, you can say, well, do I take a pod? Do I walk? Do I cycle? Do I take the bus? You know, it's the choices. So it's about giving it back to people um, and using technology, which is, it's there, it's out there at the moment. It's not, it's not like rocket science, it's not 22nd century, it's now and here. Just to echo that, we're, um, we're exploring how we can actually shape the place from the start using a different model. So um, because the roads don't exist yet, that means we have an opportunity um, to develop the highways, the public realm in a different way that can enable uh, flexible use of space or agile space, agile movement, um, which means, uh, for example, those pods which will then sort of develop into autonomous vehicles, uh, for sure, it's not that far away. Um, we can uh, work on a new type of place that can enable the AVs to work um, whilst not compromising people who want to walk and cycle around. Um, and just another type of transport, a more sort of fun type that I'll just throw in. Uh, nobody's talked about sort of drones yet, um, but we've just written into our OAPF that we will, which is, sorry, it's an opportunity area planning framework, um, that we will enable uh, roofs, uh, buildings, um, to provide those delivery spaces, uh, not for white vans, but for drones. Um, and you might think that sounds a bit crazy, but actually, probably speaking to this audience, you don't, because you're well aware of the Google uh, and, uh, and um, other, other trials. I can't remember the name of the company. It's probably just as well I don't quote it. Um, so, um, you know, that is actually genuinely something in an area that's already quite congested around Park Wall, provides quite a neat solution to a very real congestion problem um, using smart technology in the future. Really interesting. Uh, of course, drones can cause a challenge to airports. Yeah, so but, uh, we're, not huge, we're not huge fans of drones. <laughs> but, but um, I, I, I suspect, Matthew, that actually the decisions that passengers make in how they get to and from Heathrow over land are almost more of a headache for you than putting them on planes and flying them in and out. In some ways, well, that's the easy bit, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, certainly all of our um, passenger research shows that one of the bits of the journey that's potentially the most confusing for people is how do I get to the airport on which terminal am I going to? And it's all, you know, quite confusing. And how do I, how can we best help them navigate? So I like your idea of, and the concept of how do you put passengers at the heart of this and give them the data that they need. And I guess uh, we're seeing some, I guess a couple of points I make on that. We're certainly seeing some uh, on-demand kind of technology. We talked about the pods. Just a quick show of hands. Does anyone know what we're talking about? When we talk about Heathrow's pods, has anyone got on them? Apart from people who work at Heathrow, obviously would. Um, okay, so a handful of you. There's doubtless a photo outside on one of our boards, but these are little um, driverless pods. Four people can sit in them. They've got a set track from uh, Terminal 5 over about a five-minute journey to one of the car parks nearby. But the key thing is they are on demand. So you turn up, uh, you press a button, the pod's there, and it just takes you straight away. So what that's done is removed a huge number of bus journeys from around the airport. But critically for the passenger, it means that they are, uh, there's no sense of, we'll I have to turn up and wait a bit for a bus. It's, it's just there. Um, so there's a bit of that. But I guess some of the other transport around Heathrow will always run to timetables. There may be lots of trains in future, and many more with some of the connectivity I talked about, but they'll still be on timetables. So I think the key thing there is, how can you give that information to passengers uh, and people who work at the airport as well. This isn't just about passengers and share. And so they know, right, well, what are my options, my different options, and when's the next uh, Heathrow Express to London versus the next Tube, and what are the different prices? So people can actually start comparing and have that, uh, the information that puts them in charge. I think there's, we're doing bits of this already, but I think there's huge opportunity here going forward. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's sometimes easier to articulate the opportunities than, than it is to resolve the challenges and the obstacles. What are the mm. things that keep you guys awake at night? What are the real obstacles or challenges to the sort of vision that you're trying to achieve? So one of the very basic things when you're trying to build a 3D model is the sharing of data, actually, um, and getting everybody comfortable that it can be shared. And I don't think, uh, I think we probably all admit that we've sort of cracked that one yet. Um, you know, the, the Internet of Things um, is obviously you know, a fantastic thing, but vulnerable. Um, and, um, you know, getting, getting something that works, but is still safe, um, and enables people who are sharing their data to feel that their data is not compromised. I think that's quite a big challenge, um, and I don't think we're there yet. Um, so it's all very well for you know, development corporations to rock up and say, we want you, you know, UK um, power networks, we want your data, please. 
And Thames Water, we want yours. We want to put it all together into a smart utilities model. <coughs> and um, you know, these are private companies <laughs> with private data. Uh, and you know, it's, it just takes a little while to sort of work through all that. Um, I'm not necessarily sure it would keep me awake at night, but it's certainly it's a it's a challenge that we've kind of all got to work through. Mm. No, I'd agree with that. I was going to make a. Um, a slightly trite comment there. I, I talked about uh, our plans for expansion as well and looking down the agenda, seeing Boris here talking this afternoon. He's got well-known views on a third runway. I was going to say that Boris is, could be one of the people that keeps me awake <laughs> at night. But uh, no, actually, more seriously, I think the, um, the, the data point, I think, is a really key one. The, uh, and the point around integrating different IT systems. Now, I'm not an IT expert, but I know already within the airport, we've set up uh, what we think is a cutting edge initiative globally, something called the Airport Operations Center, which brings together all of the different players at the airport. And I talked about some of them earlier, but you can add to airlines, ground handlers, NATS, the air traffic services. You could add the police, surface transport providers, um, the whole range of different players that work at the airport into one operation center uh, with increasingly shared visibility of data. But in terms of integrating some of those systems, in, in a sense, the wiring behind the scenes, I think there is a way to go there. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that would certainly be an obstacle. I think the opportunity there is huge, but how can we do that in a way um, that, and we were talking about this earlier, Dan, for example, uh, in buildings where the building management system and some of the heating and cooling is integrated with information about passenger flows, for example, so you're providing the right level of heating and cooling, not too much, too little in these huge buildings at the airport for the number of people going through. I think that is uh, one of the challenges for us, certainly. The issues we've got in Hounslow, um, fairly prosaic in, in respect of, of Heathrow, are to do with air, air pollution and noise pollution. Um, and and in, in some ways you could say, well, it's completely bizarre. You're talking about doing a new Heathrow Garden City right next to Heathrow, um, right where there's, you know, poor air quality and it's extremely noisy. But on the other hand, <clears throat> what it does allow you is it allows you a, a clean slate in terms of, for instance, um, the, the construction of houses. And we know that um, constructing um, houses and schools in particular, because our children suffer very badly from the noise of planes, that puts an extra 17% on the bill costs to try and deal with the noise insulation. But at least if you're building from scratch and you start to think about how can you create a, a building that is properly noise insulated and also potentially can deal with um, air pollution, how can you build a smart building that, that can live and breathe through the use of um, vegetation, for instance, so that we can start to address those issues? Um, so we, we want to try and create buildings um, and places that, that, that work better and uses, uses technology in that way. And we are working with Heathrow on what we call a Heathrow house, so that if we were going to create a garden city, those houses would be properly insulated and that we wouldn't have to, deal with it, have to retrofit, which is what we're trying to do in Hounslow. And we've got lots of Victorian and, and Georgian, not Georgian, Victorian and, and 1930s terraces. And, and really trying to do proper sound insulation on that is very, very difficult. But a new building, new apartments that live and breathe um, and that are properly insulated, that for us is, is you know, really sort of nirvana. And, 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 you know, that's what we want from a new Heathrow Garden City. Fascinating. Okay, now, because we have a mission to overrun, I think we can do at least another 10 minutes or so. And it, I'd quite welcome the opportunity to uh, throw questions open to the floor. So if people have a think about questions for our, for our panel, there's a gentleman here at the front. If there's a microphone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rob Shaw uh, from LDA Design. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, the creation of new places uh, around major infrastructure and major infrastructure uh, expansions. One of the, the, the concerns I, I often have in these sort of things is that we forget about how that then stitches into to the existing community. And sort of receiving authority often, uh, in, in my experience, hasn't uh, or isn't able to properly spatially plan what happens at the end of the, the, the piece of infrastructure where people then uh, go, how they dissipate, what they do at that end. So uh, uh, I guess a question about how, how do we use smart city ideas as well as sort of more traditional spatial planning to, to properly knit these, uh, these new places into the existing so there's a really easy question for us. So, well, so we, we've got existing local authority and new infrastructure here. So, well, It's a big challenge for us um, in any event, knitting in a new city um, into three existing borough centres. So we've got a, a, a huge challenge on our hands in any event because um, the density um, of the community that's coming in around this super hub, or the hub of hubs, I call it, you know, it's, One it's hub no. To rule them all. Yeah. <laughs> I 
I'll have to use that one. Um, it's no mean feat. Um, and, and, and traditionally, you're right, you do it through planning, through, um, through developing fringe master plans that kind of knit it all in and you rework the transports and all, all the rest of it. Um, and I think you've sort of hit on something there that actually we should be thinking much more uh, broadly about our smart strategy um, to actually um, use that as a tool um, to knit in the fringes. Um, yeah, Heather, you've already talked about the importance of sub-regional yes. planning. Um, it would be great if we could talk smart, but I think, you know, really fundamentally, we don't in the UK have a system that allows us to sub-regionally plan, full stop. We have a duty to cooperate. Now, duty to cooperate really depends on how much your neighbouring authorities and adjacent authorities want to cooperate. Now, we've been leading, um, bringing together all the authorities within the Heathrow hinterland, that's about six or seven different authorities, with very different, different political views and outlooks upon Heathrow. And we've, we've, we're bringing together with Heathrow to say, look, Heathrow is here, it's a massive piece of infrastructure. We should be planning and thinking about how it can benefit our communities and also mitigate the impacts on a much more coordinated and collaborative basis. And we, we started the first meeting that Hanzo led back in, in, in September, and we've got meetings set up throughout um, the rest of, um, up until December and hopefully going forward. And in a way, having Heathrow and the debate about the third runway has been very helpful because it sort of focuses minds. You know, whatever happens with the expansion, we need to be doing this. Um, and we need to think about how can we best use it to deal with um, the, the regeneration we need in our borough and, you know, other boroughs. I mean, in Feltham and the west of our borough, and we're taking it through a west of the borough plan, we have really quite bad deprivation, despite the fact that Feltham is only a mile and a half from Heathrow. There's no direct rail link. And many of the jobs that people have in Feltham are relatively low level. And in fact, people, um, the amount of employment from Feltham, in, in Feltham that is directly attributed to Heathrow has dropped over the past few years, and that's because things like baggage handling and the lower order jobs are becoming increasingly mechanised. And so we know that we need to make sure that Felton residents and those surrounding areas have better skills and they can better access transport to get them to the airport and that they can get better skills and training to access the better and higher order jobs. And we want to have those conversations with our neighbouring boroughs and plan strategically because this is a huge opportunity for growth. We see 10,000 houses in Hounslow alone. What is the opportunity in the sub-region? We should be thinking on a very sub-regional level. So I'd like to think smart, that would be great, but can we just get around the table and have proper conversations and agree where the new expansion is going to be and then let's collaborate and plan accordingly. And we have some very useful tools, even though I say we can't plan sub-regionally, we do actually have some useful spatial planning tools. And if we could just raise our game at a local authority level and start to see the bigger picture, that I think would be the big step forward. And just quickly to build on that, the um, I think it's always interesting to look at how other countries approach this, and I think there's some real learning in exactly what Heather's described, certainly from visits I've made to both uh, Paris and Amsterdam to see their airports, where they do, uh, they have genuinely regionally planned around the airport and said this is a really significant economic engine for the area. How can we look, not just at a local authority level, but look in a more uh, coherent and planned way at how we harness the benefits of that, integrate within transport networks? And that's partly a result of different political systems, the French more sensitive centrally planned relatively, so more of a top-down approach. And the Dutch, I think, partly because uh, Amsterdam Airport is so significant for the economy uh, and given the size of the Netherlands relatively, uh, that in a sense they've needed to do that. But I think we're really pleased to be working with hands on the kind of sub-regional planning agenda that Heather's described, because I think, given some of the challenges that the UK does have in that space, I think we need, in a sense, to kind of create some of that bottom-up as much as we can. Uh, we do have time for a couple more questions. There's um, uh, the lady here. Hello, I'm Jill Thompson. I'm, I'm a project manager and urban designer from Brighton and Hove City Council. Um, I'd like to um, just let everybody know today is Back to the Future Day. Isn't it is, it? yes, it is Back to the Future told Day. That yet, which was clearly a big inspirational film, and I know plenty of um, people who have sort of turned them on to the whole idea of um, looking to the future and uh, changing things. Is there a piece of literature, a film, or a piece of music um, that any of you can think of that's inspired, could inspire us to look at smart cities and maybe has inspired us um, wow. changing the future? What a brilliant question. Uh, I'm not sure I've got an answer. For those who do, while you're thinking, for those who don't know what Back to the Future Day is, um, in 1985, when Back to the Future 2 came out, Marty McFly travelled 30 years into the future. 
to today, to the 21st of October 2015, where there were hoverboards and all sorts of wonderful things that sadly we don't quite have yet. When we first put together a, an initial film for Old Oak and Park Royal, about, we had a flyover of it. Um, we did a bit of a tongue-in-cheek song, actually. Um, it was uh, more cheaper. Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, so that, that, we could sort of throw that into uh, throw that into the mix while I think of a better answer. Actually, one I can give you, which has just come to me, and thanks for stalling a bit there, Dan. I have come up with one, um, which is, and it is a book I'd recommend you read, and it builds on the point I was just making about Paris and Amsterdam, is a book called, uh, and it's not a kind of exciting, sexy bit of fiction or anything, but a book called Aerotropolis by uh, Professor John Casada, US, um, a well-known uh, US academic who studied the role of airports in uh, economic development around the world and has this idea of, airport, of air, an aerotropolis where the airport is the centre of a whole uh, economy effectively and how can you best plan around that for the future. So, and it's a very, it's a well-written and engaging book. He wrote it with a journalist, so it's kind of not your typical academic book. It's very accessible. Um, oh God, well, I suppose, I mean, for me, it's the whole thing about um, cities full stop. And for me... Um, I personally, I stick my iPad on, iPod on and anything incredibly rock, corny, I don't know, what a cheesy music, and I put it on and I go running in the city and you just think this, this to me is what it should all be about, being able to experience architecture, the whole buzz and life of the city at high speed. Well, I'm not that high speed runner, actually. Um, and with, some, with Billy Idol screaming at me, and I just love it. And that's what does it to me, and I go off and do a bit of spatial planning after it. But there you go. That's what town planners do, but sad. Brilliant. Victoria, you had a, another thought. I've just got thought. another tongue-in-cheek one, actually. Um, this project, Old Oak Park Royal, isn't new to sort of this year. It's been around for some time. Indeed, I think Sir Terry Farrell was talking about it back in 2009 10 uh, the then leader of Hammersmith and Fulham uh, had a promotional film. Um, I, if any of you want to see it, it is on YouTube. Um, and um, it was setting out the vision for the future off the back of HS2 and Crossrail coming to Old Oak. And um, it's, quite a, it's quite a funny song, actually. It's by a, a group called Starship. Um, this city was uh, built on, uh, well, his version was uh, Road and Rail. Um, so um, do YouTube it. Um, it's got an earlier version of our plan, but actually, on a serious point, we are now taking those plans, we've dusted them off, and four years later, we've, uh, we've launched it. So. Well, what I think is brilliant about the question is it reminds us that there's, this is a, there's a very strong human element to this, and it's very easy to get wrapped up in sort of big picture thinking about infrastructure. But as I sort of tried to allude to with one of my earlier questions, this is about people at the end of the day. And, uh, surprised with the most unexpected question <laughs> I've really. ever had, actually. Absolutely. I, I often make the point, speaking of events like this, that nobody wants to live in a smart city or visit a smart airport. They want to live in a city where the air's clean and the roads aren't congested and an airport that's smooth and efficient. And so my own personal definition of smart is something that eases the friction of the citizen's path through life. So, uh, Do we have, we have time for some more questions? Yes, gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, Rob Anderson, leader of Slowborough Council. Um, just following on from the, from the lady's question there, uh, and also it links into what um, uh, Heather said earlier on about what keeps her awake at night. If you looked at, if you looked at Back to the Future 2 uh, 30 years on, if, if a group of clever people like us were sitting in a room 30 years ago, we might have what, predicted in the future, we might have come up with the idea that there was going to be a fax machine in every room of the house mm -hmm. as our vision of what was technologically possible in the future. You know, my teenage kids don't even know what a fax machine is. Um, and the danger of all of this is that we predict the wrong things. And it goes back to Vicky's, uh, Heather's point about um, how do you keep uh, things open. Uh, and I think it's the, the challenge for all of us, and uh, I'd ask the panel to say how they're going to do that in their organisations, is how do we open up our organisations with data so that we're not protectionist or worried about data being open, so that those people who are ready to embrace the future and do the things that we can't even envisage now have got the ability to do it. And that's really interesting. I think also underlying your question is, is the need to future-proof what we're doing, isn't it? It's about putting in place underlying mechanisms and infrastructure, but not trying to prescriptively decide or design what things are going to look like in 10, 20, 30 years, because we just don't know. Um, I just, uh, a couple of uh, points. Um, it's a very good question. Um, I work for the Mayor of London, and if we just take one of his functional bodies, Transport for London, that's the approach they've absolutely taken. It wasn't initially the approach, they were brought along that journey, but now through the open data store, um, they actually worked out that they'd be better continuing to be a transport authority and let somebody else build the apps. So they just put all the data up and all the apps that we all use, um, none of them are done by TfL because they're busy running the service. Um, they actually just made all the data available so that other people could create apps that now make our life easier. 
Um, so that's sort of um, point one. I think we can all learn from that. Uh, my colleague Andrew College will be talking about the London Data Store that's doing far more than that now. Um, and then if we just look at the organisation that I'm working for, a, as you might imagine, a, a new mayoral development corporation, um, it's only the second one, is um, it's open to much scrutiny. And, you know, it, not everybody was jumping with joy um, when Boris sort of moved in to take planning powers off of the local boroughs. Um, so we are not only open to much scrutiny, we need to start off on the best possible foot, which means um, nothing to hide, everything open and transparent right from the start. So absolutely, I, I concur, that's the way you need to do it. We don't need to just do it to, to build in our, um, our, our partners um, and, and get every bought, everybody bought into what we're doing. Um, we need to do it because actually we think that it will help people um, solve the issues and conundrums we have to meet some of our objectives. Say, in a way, all this new thinking actually should be underpinned by really old thinking, which is the, the strong principles of good urban design. Um, because if you get your urban design right, um, it doesn't matter how much life changes. People still need to walk. They still need to live in safe, secure environments. Um, buildings need to be flexible and change. And if we look at our most successful places, they are all built around principles of good, strong urban design, connectivity, accessibility. Um, Buildings are flexible. You can take a Victorian terrace house. How many times can you bash a Victorian terrace house and reinterpret it? But it's, you know, it's a very simple, straightforward and flexible way of, of building. So I think we need to not try and, in a way, be too clever. I think we tried to be too clever in the 60s and we're trying to still, you know, as a profession, planners are constantly apologising for it and we're constantly going around trying to rebuild and, and make, make good the messes we did in the 60s. So good, strong urban design stick hard to close to the principles of accessibility and connectivity, good infrastructure, and I don't think you can go far wrong. Mm. Actually, that, that's, a really, that's a reassuring answer to what was a very <laughs> big and challenging question, actually. And I think um, just a, a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, the data point, I think, is an interesting one for us. I, I absolutely agree with the principle of transparency. I think really some of the data that's linked to the airport for very good reasons you wouldn't make widely available, but we need to find a way through that. Um, I think, and if you look at the growth of Heathrow over the last 70 or so years, I guess you see a uh an airport that's grown organically, and not all of it has, although at the time we'd have thought we were applying principles of good airport design, actually not all of it was flexible, which is why actually we've started to knock down some of the oldest bits of the airport and replace them with something which we think is much more flexible for the future, uh, and we think we'll be able to, to do that over time. But I think, the, I think um, Heather's point about uh, good urban design is a good one to root us in as well. And I think I just want to add, actually, that um, particularly back to the data point and the open data and availability of data, it's also important to recognise that ultimately, if we're going to actually have a genuine data economy, uh, we need to recognise that not all data will be free. And that if we want people to make data available that has a value or a perceived value, we also need to actually create a functioning data economy or a functioning data mar marketplace. And I think we're very early on here now. So we're doing, with my other hat, Living Planet hat, we're doing some work in the city of Copenhagen around the big data marketplace. So your challenge, how do you get utilities to share data? Well, they might need to monetize it in some way. They might need to be a mechanism whereby the data they have that has a value actually leads to some sort of monetary value to them. And uh, it's quite early days, I think, around the world in how we're doing this, but ultimately we're gonna need a functioning data economy um, as part of our normal economy, which sort of helps drive a lot of this thinking. So I think we've probably got time for one more quick question. Um, lady here, and if I, we need to keep the answers relatively tight. Hello, hi, Isabel Woods from Warsaw Council. Heard a lot about the movement of people. Um, I'd be interested to understand the panel's thoughts about the movement involved with businesses in terms of goods, and also how the developments that you're, you're bringing on board are going to be supporting the businesses for the future. So, I mean, really quick thoughts from me, given time. Um, it it's fundamental for us. I talked earlier about passengers at Heathrow, but the fact that under the bottom half of every plane is full of goods being exported, quarter of the UK's export, so it is significant for us. There are things we're doing there, but I think you're right, I didn't really touch on, but huge opportunities to use some of these technologies in the future as well. So already we're doing things at Heathrow like uh, consolidating all of the deliveries to the airport, so which is, I think, was kind of leading edge practice when we started to do it. I'm sure much more widely used now. So rather than having lots of lorries driving in and out to the airport, uh, we have a consolidation centre actually also near a railhead where uh, deliveries can be consolidated uh, and brought in um, but I think uh, yeah I mean all of the technologies that we've talked about this morning you can see uh, equally applying to transport of goods in and out of the airport as well yeah. very much so and I probably should have said more on Park Royal if I'd had time um, but it's worth remembering that uh, Park Royal which is in our boundary 
is the UK's largest, possibly Europe's largest industrial park and most successful because it's got the lowest vacancy rates um, and the highest rental values. And I think, um, you know, because it is so successful, it has its challenges, um, congestion being one of them. So clearly smart technology has to play a role in consolidating and changing the way um, that, that it operates if we as a corporation are asking it to intensify so that the area can benefit off the back of HS2. Um, part of the reason it's there, of course, is because of Heathrow, but it's also there serving London. Um, so it's very important for us um, because, not least, it's a big challenge uh, for the local community in, in terms of impacts. Um, yes, I mean, freight and logistics is a massive um, economic sector within Hounslow because of Heathrow, effectively. Um, we are working with Heathrow on their freight demand study, I think, at the moment, um, which is a bit mind-boggling. Um, but what we're effectively doing from a strategic planning point of view is looking at, I suppose, consolidating those sorts of much more um, freight logistical um, operations towards the west of the borough and sort of balancing it against, you know, trying to get it off the roads as well as possible, and we're trying to balance the movement with people, obviously getting people off the roads. So, I mean, it's, it's not easy, but we're trying to deal with it by, by putting those sorts of freight and logistics towards the west of Borough, where, the, where there is the major infrastructure. And again, comes back to the sub-regional planning discussion with all our neighbours and adjacent boroughs and, and, and plan in a much more sub-regional way and a much more intelligent way. Now, you could have an entire conference just about uh, the impact of transport on, uh, on economic development and on smart city development. But that's been a fascinating session. Uh, I'd just like to thank the panel for their time and their insights.